All right. This will be the final section of chapter six, Laplace transform, and this also is going to be um, the last section of the whole semester. So we will be talking about the last thing we uh, about differential equations. We have done so far. Um, let's take harmonic oscillator as example. We have, have done so far that we have harmonic oscillators, and this time we can do external force. Okay, so we have the exter external force. And then we say, well, we can still solve it using Laplace transform. Before this is a non-homogeneous case, it's gonna be difficult, but for Laplace transform, it's easy. Okay, so can we solve this? Really depends on, number one, can you find the Laplace transform of this external force? And number two, after that, can you do the partial fraction? And then after that, can you do the inverse? Whatever you get from there. Okay, so that's basically, what we want, uh, what we have for Laplace transforms, that give us some limitations because we only know so much. We only know so many Laplace transforms. For now, what do we know? We know Ft can be, uh, number one, it can be heavy side, uh, which is UAD. We know the Laplace transform of that. It can be impulsing. Uh, delta AT, we know the Laplace transform of that. And then, of course, we, it can be some functions we had known before. That is exponential. And a trig. And exponential plus trig. So it's almost like uh, what we got from the harmonic oscillators, right? We have the e to the at, uh, cosine omega t, and sine omega t type. Okay, Corresponding to linear and irreducible quadratic uh, factors. So that's the only forces we know so far that if it's one of these, we can do it because we know how to do the Laplace transform of Ft once we apply L on both sides. Now, of course, in real life, your force can be anything, right? Your force can be an impulsing force combined with a heavy side force and exponential trig force, or maybe some other forces like a polynomial, like one over T and things like that. So how do you actually solve this one in general? Okay, that is gonna be our question here. That is, how do you solve this problem? harmonic oscillator for any t, any ft, any type of force, not just the types that um, you know about the Laplace transform, but also the part that you do not know the Laplace transform, especially if you think about it, um, because we need to do this. In order to get something, we finish the problem with something, and then we do the L inverse. maybe some expressions involving fs, and then we get the original function, which is something involving ft. So since we're taking the Laplace transform and then taking the inverse Laplace transform later, okay, it's almost like we do not actually need to know the Laplace transform of ft because you are gonna eventually get rid of it by doing the inverse, right? Of course, it's not gonna be so easy as just taking it and taking the inverse because you're gonna multiply things, plus things and minus things. Therefore, there should be a way Possibly that we can even do this without knowing what is the Laplace transform of FT. But we can still solve somehow the differential equations like this. So how do we do that? Let's see. Okay, for any FT. Well, the first thing is we just assign this to be zero for simplicity. If they're not zero, you know they are just going to add some uh, initial conditions. It's just going to add some term like e to the t sine t there. So it's not our concern here. It's more about how do you handle this ft here. So if we do the Laplace transform on both sides. Okay, we will have f s squared plus 4. Let's just take fs, which equals, uh, 
it's just easier to write down fs okay so now what we can do is we can do this and then we have uh, fs times 1 over s square plus 4 which is divided by this okay so now if you have some initial conditions that will change the top of this one you're going to have something like 2 plus s or whatever which can be handled so it's not a big deal so we will always have some expressions like this. Now, can we do the L inverse? Really depends on do you know the Laplace transform, and if you know how that thing is going to change your inverse Laplace transform. And so far, we can do the delta, we can do the delay. That's what we have so far. Okay. But now, if you think about it, what do you have here? Okay. You are basically taking the L inverse of fs and another function we will call it gs. That's what you're trying to do. Moreover, moreover, you do know, you do know L inverse F, which is just F. Because you just use F as to represent the Laplace transform of F. So you do know the inverse of this. And do you know the inverse of GS? Now, where does GS come from? GS come from everything left hand side which has nothing to do with the initial condition uh no, no sorry the external force it only comes from the initial conditions and the left hand side therefore this part is always doable for harmonic oscillator because you know everything about harmonic oscillator for this case it's going to be sine 2t but in general cases we know this we know this we just don't know this So now it's settled. So we can solve this as long as we can develop something which is almost like a product rule of L inverse. If we can rewrite it as some expression involving FT and the GT, which is the individual Laplace inverse Laplace transform of FS, S, FS and GS, then we will be able to solve this because we already know each individual part. We just don't know the inverse Laplace transform when you multiply them together. Okay, If you just have them plus together, that's pretty easy because we know our inverse is, is linear. So if this is F plus G, we can simply just do this. Right? The difficult part is actually when you multiply them together, it's not so easy. For example, if you multiply them with e to the negative as, you have to actually do a delay function, which we have to go over all the hustles in order to have this happen. So now what we need is a product rule of fs and gs. Assuming we know each individual part, how do we combine them in order to get the inverse Laplace transform of the product? Okay, that's what we're having here. All right, so now we need this product. Actually, later we will show this is actually the convolution of functions, f and g, okay? So basically it comes from the product rule of L inverse times gs. Okay. So here, this is our setup. We do know f, t, and g, t. We also know LFT equals FS and LGT equals GS. All right, we just don't know what FS exactly is. So now let's say, assuming if we look at FS and GS, can we somehow find the L inverse? Oh, L inverse, FG. That's what we want. If we can do that, at least for harmonic oscillators, we can do all the uh, kinds of forces, assuming we already know FT. Okay, and we want this one to be write it in term of. It may sound tricky. Let's finish the proof first, and then you go ahead and try to see. Okay, we'll give you several examples, and you go ahead and try to see what we're trying to do here. All right, so let's let's try that. Okay, so 
FSGS is going to be from 0 to infinity FT E negative ST okay DT that's the first one okay now uh, let's use tau and um, 0 to infinity GT let's use U G U E negative S U D U so that's the Laplace transform 1 Laplace transform 2 for F and G okay now what we want to do is we want to actually put them together and change the variable so now let okay let T equals tau plus U Okay, try to think about it. G equals tau plus u. Then we're going to take this one. Okay, and we write it to be this. G u. Because there are two different variables, right? And they're totally separable, so therefore we can actually put this together. And E negative S tau plus U. Okay. Uh, D tau DU. Which way order do I want it? I want DU D D tau DU. Yes, that's right. Okay, so far, so good. Now with the change of variable, we can actually rewrite it to be integration from zero to infinity. Okay, integration. Let's hold on a second. F. Now tau equals t minus u because of the change of variable here. Okay. G is just u. All right. E to the negative s t because we want Laplace transform. So we finally rewrite this part to be the t. Okay. Now d tau equals dt. So we can change this to dt. No problem. Okay, I will circle everywhere I change the variable. Okay, I change this into that. This into that, this into that. Maybe I, uh, I can just use this. Okay, so finally, du, everything is okay. okay. Now the only difference now is we're gonna change the ending point. We didn't change u. So originally u was from zero to infinity. Your u is still from zero to infinity. Originally, your tau goes from 0 to infinity. Your t equals tau plus u, therefore, should go from u to infinity. Because your tau start from 0, so your t start from u. So the only thing I'm going to change here is u infinity. From here to here. That's all the part I changed the variable, and this is still good. All right. Finally, we want to do one more step. That step is, I want to change this one to be a whole Laplace transform, which is almost there, okay? So final step is, I want to switch the order of du and dt. We use calculus three, okay? So what do we have here? Well, we have um, t and du. Hold on, hold on. T and U. Okay. okay. So what's your integration? Your U go from zero to infinity, and your T go from U to infinity. Therefore, this is T equals U. Okay. From U to infinity, what you're trying to do is you're trying to take integration. So probably should I? Uh, yeah. Let's just do this. Okay. That's the region you're trying to take in the integration. Okay. Now, if you want to switch the order, it's pretty easy to see. Okay, fine. Instead of doing things in this way, the red way, which is the old way, I want to do things in the blue way. Okay. So what we have is integration from 0 to infinity, dt. And for each one, we go from here all the way to here. So we go from 0 all the way to t, du. So we are doing the same region, but instead of doing it in type, hold on, 
instead of doing it in type one, we change it into type two region, if you still remember. What do you have in calculus one? If you don't, that's fine. We're just basically redoing the same thing. One times in DU first, one time in DT first. Okay, so we can do that. And we copy everything in, in the middle because nothing changed. We just change the order. So all the variables stay the same. The reason we're doing this is we don't want infinity in the middle. Yes. Okay. Now what we want to do is we want to switch the order. Because clearly this one has nothing to do with u. So we can switch it with du and do the integration on this part first. So we can switch the order. Let's just wait more, write one more step. And the reason I want to switch everything is I want to show you if you take this part and try to take a look, what is this? This part is a function of t after you integrate with respect to u. Therefore, everything I write down here is nothing but l this okay which I treat this one as a function of t then from here you can see from 0 to infinity dt e negative st with a function of t therefore this function of t even though it looks weird okay that is going to be uh, the function we're trying to do for Laplace transform so let me write it down what we just did we did calculus 3 we did change of variables we did the change of uh, regions, not change of regions. We integrate the same region with two different types to switch. And finally, we have something like this. That is F S G S equals L. That's two Laplace transform and we can show it merge into one Laplace transform. That's equivalent to say L inverse which is what we want, can be written as, as this. It's not pretty, but at least this is something that, one, as long as we know f and g individually, we can find this one. This is called the convolution of two functions. Later, we will tell you like what this really means, you know, uh, in physics. But for now, um, at least we can write down that is um, we define it to be f multiply, but we don't want to use dot, which is multiplication, multiplication or times. We want to use um, star to indicate this is a special type of product. It's the convolution. If you can do it, finish this and finish it as sine t or something like that, be my guest. But if you couldn't, you can just keep the whole thing in this way. Where is the integral there? Okay, that's also fine. Because later, if you really need to plug in a t and calculate what this number is, you can just simply do a numerical integral. Okay, you don't actually have to know how to do the integration. You can just keep everything in this way. Okay, so very quick examples. E t convoluted with uh, sine t is going to be If you can do the integration, go ahead. If you couldn't, just keep it that way. That's a function. That's a function of t. Yeah, plug in different t, I got different numbers. Even though I don't know how to get the numbers by hand, that's fine. Okay. Um, that's basically what we have. Now, with this definition, what properties do we have? We just did it. We have fs, gs, or more precisely, we have lf, lg, equals l. F convoluted with G. That's what we just proved. 
or in another word, we can have L inverse fs gs equals equals f circle g. It's the same same way to say say two things. That's the convolution. Okay. That's it. That's just something you need to know about convolutions. Um, defining a weird or not weird way. It's an integral form. And if you're really into the number, you can actually plug in, plug it into the computer and do it numerically. Or if you're lucky, you can actually do the integral. You can also do that. Now let's go back to the examples and try to see how this one helps us. We said, okay, we want everything, any kind of external forces. We did everything, and we find that Ly equals equals what? Equals Lf, which is Fs, times 1 over S squared plus 4. OK, now what do we know? We want this, of course. where fs equals lf. We didn't even know how to find the Laplace transform. We just know, OK, this is the notation. And the gs is going to be l sine 2t, 1 half, actually. OK, so we do know the inverse Laplace transform of this and this. Now, what about the multiply together? Now, by the prop property of uh, convolution, this one is going to give you f circle g. Okay. Your f is going to be this, therefore it's going to be f zero t. Okay. f t minus u, one half sine to u du. For whatever force you put here. Okay, if you put delta t, fine. If you put u a t, fine. If you put exponential, fine. You put sine, fine. You put whatever force is there. This is going to be your final answer. Sometimes I can solve it using integral to get a nice clean form. Sometimes I couldn't. Then I just keep my answer to be this way. But there's no way you can deny that this is actually a function of t once you finish integration with respect to u. Okay, so that's basically what we got. F circle g. In this way, whatever force you put in, I can always find this. Okay. Of course, in real life, how do you do it? Well, usually it's done numerically, which means you just use Riemann sum, which you should take n goes to infinity, but you just use maybe a hundred rectangles or maybe a thousand rectangles to give a really nice approximation, assuming all the functions are nice. Okay, that's basically what we got for using convolutions. We can solve anything now as long as you can eventually get something which is something you know and something you know multiplied together in terms of Laplace transform. And we do have a product rule to actually do the inverse of them. You just simply convolute them. All right, so that's what we got. Mathematically, it's pretty easy. As long as you are very proficient with this property, you can always write down your solutions in that way. Of course, for now, we need to think about, well, well, this thing looks weird, or is it? Well, what is this? I can do the computation. I can memorize the formula, but really, this should make sense. So what is this? Okay, uh, to do that, I can give you some examples to give you um, intuition about why we have something like that. So the first thing we need to think about, we can think about things in signals. Okay. So you keep your receiving signals from somewhere and your signals has a decay. And this function can be described as G. To make it easy, 
let's use um, discrete values. So this is your GT, T equals zero, one, two, three, four. So what does this do? This one tells you that if you receive a signal strength, okay, after a while, your signal is gonna decay. For example, if you receive um, a signal strength of five at T equals zero, how much is left at T equals one? Then what you do is you use five times G1 because G1 quantifies your decay. Usually it's exponential decay, okay? So like if you have a signal with, with strength five right away, you receive five, okay? But if you wait for one second, what's gonna happen? The signal is gonna decay. It's not as strong as five anymore. After a second, it's gonna be smaller than, 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 smaller than uh, five. But how small is that? It depends on your channel. It depends on your gadget, how fast that, that thing decays, okay? So at T equals two, you only have F five times G2 left, okay? And maybe this one was 100%. This is roughly like, okay, after one second, you only have 75% left. After one second, you only have 50% left. After one second, you only have like, uh, I don't know, 28%. Maybe after another second, you only have 17% and just keep going. Okay, so what you need to do is just, you use it to time. You use the initial. Uh, strength of signal times what? Times um, the decay. I won't call it percentage. It's just times the decay coefficient. All right. I think that's reasonable. As long as we know this G, given any signal, we know how much uh, of the strength of the signal le are left after a certain time, okay? Because G give, basically give you everything of that by multiplication. Now assume we have a signal. This signal give us is described by FT. So you plug in a T, you got all kinds of signal. The first signal happens at zero. The second signal happens at F1. The third signal has happens at, at F2 and they have different strength. and so on. So you have different strengths of signals. Okay, so now my question is, how much, or what's the total signal? At t equals 10. So how much signal I'm gonna receive at time 10? Now imagine what's gonna happen. Are you gonna receive the first signal? Yes, but that thing has decayed for 10 seconds until you get here. So the first signal was here, signal one was here. It was this strong, but then it decayed for, for 10 seconds until it reached 10. Let's, let's call it signal zero, just to stay out of confusion. Okay, good. What about signal one? Signal one was here. And by the time you receive at 10, it the original strength was smaller than the first signal, but this one has decayed for nine seconds. Okay. Signal two has been decayed for eight seconds. Signal three has been decayed for seven seconds. And signal nine has been decayed for one second. And the signal 10 is fresh. I just receive it. There's no delay. Okay, so what's my total signal that I receive? That should be the signal I receive from zero decayed for 10 seconds. Okay, and that is gonna be F zero. The first signal, the zero signal, decayed for 10 seconds, which I times G10. Because, you know, if you're having the same channel, same gadget, they decay at the same rate. Plus, the, the first signal decayed by, decayed by nine seconds. The second signal decayed by eight seconds. And from here you can see, okay, the pattern is pretty clear. That is the later the signal, the smaller the decay. Okay. Now 
Now if you write it down, this is nothing but f 10 minus Ten minus i, g i. Make sense here? So you have you, you have how much signal have you received? You have received the eleven signals, okay, starting from zero. Okay, but each signal decay for a different period of time. The earlier the signal, the earlier the signal. Okay, the longer the decay. Okay, so if you have a big eye, that means an early signal and a long decay. A small eye means what? A very late signal, a very recent signal with a very small decay. Okay, so what you're trying to do is you're just trying to combine signal and decay together. And finally, you need to sum them together because your signal just continuously comes in. Uh -huh. This is the signal. This is the decay. <laughs> decay. Okay. And of course, you have a lot of the signals coming in. Now, does it look familiar? That's the total signal you receive at 10. Now, what's the total signal we receive at t? That's going to be. Now, I want to change your i to be u to make it, which doesn't change a thing. Okay, and and what if, what if your signal is coming in continuously? That means you don't have ten signals. They don't just wait for one second and and just keeps coming in. What if they become continuous at any moment? Okay, at any moment. Your signal is coming in. You still have the same volume, but now you just don't have one, two, three, four, five, six anymore. Instead, you have everything from zero all the way to t, including all the possible values, including point zero one, one point six, and things like that. And so, instead of doing this, you take the integration. That is the convolution definition. So you do have a discrete version, but really, if you think about it. It's nothing but you fix the time, you receive a lot of signals before that time. Every single signal you receive, they decay a, a while. This gives you the original strength of the signal. This gives you the decay. Signal strength. This gives you the decay rate. So you have this nice uh, symmetric property that is the earlier the signal, uh, the smaller the decay. Okay, and uh, the long, the later, <laughs> take it back, the earlier the signal, signal, the bigger the decay, which means you need to take a later value in, in your decay rate. The more recent of your signal, the smaller the decay, which means you need to take an earlier rate, earlier value of your GU. And because it's exactly symmetric, you can also think about this one as uh, uh, a signal and the other one as a decay. So either way, it works because it's symmetric. F's convolute with G is the same as G convolute with F. Okay, so now if you go back and try to think about what's going on here, it becomes interesting. Well, before we said, well, this one looks pretty weird. Your solution looks like uh, this. But now if you look at it, is it so weird? Well, let's take a look. Take a look. We are going to view this one as our decay rate, right? That means what? We have an underdamped. Actually. Uh, it's undamped. Uh, 
uh, harmonic oscillator. And this is going to be our signal. That is the original signal we receive from external force. So say, hey, here is my solution at time t. So what what what's the height of my or, or what's the amplitude of my vibration of my wave? Well, it's gonna be the first one, and this one was caused by F zero, right? Initially, you have a force, therefore you have a wave. This wave is gonna be this tall, and it was generated, but it should follow the original spring. So it's here. That's what you receive from the first force. Now, what about the second force? Actually, there's no second force. What about this force? You receive us FT from here. That is going to generate a wave like this, which is here. Okay. What I, am I going to receive for this force here? For suppose the force is here. Then you are going to generate another wave, which is like this. Okay. So how many different? How is this amplitude constructed? Of number one, it should be related to the force. Okay. It should be related to the initial force and whatever force, and you should act actually add all these kind of forces together, all the effect coming from this force together. But keep in mind, if you apply a force which is 2 Newton, doesn't mean that you are going to receive something which is 2 here, because, because your force can only propagate in this format. Okay, so maybe, if you pick just right, you're going to receive this one, maybe you're going to receive this one. So even though uh, your force will determine how big this ampli amplitude is going to be, but what you really have is, um, Actually, did I do the right thing? I probably want to be a little bit more careful. Mm. Technically, this is not right. Well, let's just go with it. Okay, and then I will explain why I don't feel right, but I don't want to go into the details right now. But basically, finally, what do you receive here for all the signal? That will be all the forces after they propagate through here. So the signal strength is, is determined by the force, but how they are going to propagate is determined by the spring. That means no matter how strong your force is, your force should follow this. Okay, The frequency will be exactly the natural frequency of the spring, no matter how big your force is. Okay, So basically, finally, what the amplitude here is just going to be the accumulation of all the possible forces, generate all the possible waves, and sum together. That's the meaning of this convolution. So finally, uh, what do I want to say here is one half sine to you, you do have this. Okay. Now if you apply a force here, what you're going to do is you're going to actually boost this thing up to change the amplitude to be this. Keep the frequency but change the amplitude. Okay, so this is actually should be the first wave I, I draw instead of the wave I shifted here because I did shift everything up, which is technically wrong. Okay, so let me mark it here. This is just for idea for me to draw because it's clear, to, clear, more clear to see it if I draw it in this way. But actually, it's technically wrong. The real thing here is actually your um, force change, changes the amplitude. So what you really have is actually a wave like this and maybe a wave like that. Everybody with a frequency of two, but they should still be, uh, yeah, you can see it gets messy. <laughs> Based on, okay, the center is still at zero. So what you receive here is going to be accumulation of everything here. Okay, so this is more a more accurate way to draw it. This is technically wrong because I shifted everything. Actually, this is not too bad. So let's erase that. Okay, this is not too hard to see. All right, but they have to be, I won't say decay, but you need to consider how the force is going to propagate. Okay, that's basically why we have this kind of um, accumulation of convolution. So basically, it's defined by convolution functions. So from here, you can see the final solution actually makes sense. It's just a lot of forces. Each one propagates up to now, okay, and you just sum them all together. So everybody before should, should count. But every force, should, you should also weigh in, number one, how strong the force is, 
originally, and number two, uh, how, which stage at the propagation you are at. For example, you have a very strong force to change everything, but if you just happen to be at this origin, uh, not origin, at the axis here, that means even though this thing is very strong, but what you receive here is just zero, simply because you just pick the right time such that the vibration stops. Okay, that will be all we have for uh, chapter six and.